Hello, my name is Tyler Moore from the University of Tulsa, and today I'll be starting our introduction to economics. Um, so we've already completed a whirlwind tour through information security. Uh, today we begin, uh, in multiple parts, the same equivalent tour through economics. Uh, so here's an outline of what we'll do. Um, we'll full, first today talk about the key notions of why how economics works, um, and in particular introduce the notion of modeling. Uh, we will in later videos talk about uh, preferences, utility, and expected utility. Okay, so why again are we studying economics? Well, economics is a social science and uh, its key aim is to study the behavior of individuals and firms in order to predict outcomes. Um, and it does this using tools um, and the, the key tool is um, modeling which can help understand how behavior should work and predicting how it can work and then um, through systematic observation evaluating the accuracy of those models. Um, now on the one hand um, ec economists have an advantage in that there's so much going on in the world around you that it's, you can go out and collect data uh, wherever you'd like um, but the disadvantage is that very rarely can you can conduct experiments uh, like you can, like you can in a bench science. So you're you're often uh, stuck with this observational data. Um, but uh, ec economists have developed mechanisms for dealing uh, with the challenges that that faces. So at its core, economics is um, involved in the study of how trade-offs exist between conflicting interests. And so it recognizes that, that people, organizations, companies all operate strategically. And um, the discipline has come up with ways to examine those trade-offs systematically through uh, modeling and analysis. It serves to, to remind you that, again, ec economics is not just about money. That's useful to help reveal preferences it can serve as a common measure for costs and benefits, but it's not all about that. Uh, because again, at its core, it's about trade-offs between conflicting interests and incentives, um, and studying those in a quantifiable way in order to predict what the expected outcome should be. Economists like to construct models of the world. And by definition, these are always simplifications. So you can think about um, you know, a market. Uh, so here, here's a picture of an Indian market. Um, and you can see, you know, it's got rich detail. It's got these wonderfully colorful spices. You can just imagine if you were there, all the aromas you would, you would detect. And, you know, there's people around. They're so lively. And th th this is the real world. And, and in fact, each of these things influence outcomes, right? So perhaps the, you know, the most visually pleasing uh, vendor um, is going to be the one who succeeds the most in, in sales. But we take this wonderfully vivid world and then we project onto it a simplified view of the world uh, and, and, and constructing models. So uh, the one model that most everyone will have at least heard of is a, the mo model of supply and demand. And here you're comparing price to quantity and the, as you uh, increase the quantity then that, that, that affects, the, that affects the supply, both what can be supplied and the, the demand. So you have this mathematical simplification of the world uh, which is clearly not going to capture all the richness of the reality uh, that we live in. Um, and so it's important to start with the recognition that all models are wrong but some are useful. So uh, you can always criticize a model for it uh, not being realistic, but in fact, what matters is that it is in fact useful. So uh, several different types of models used in economics. You have an analytical model where you think about what you would expect an agent, would be that a user or a firm, a consumer or a firm, um, what their beliefs are, and uh, then you examine the implications. So this, so you, this is really good for coming up with a theoretical analysis of how a, a scenario might operate, um, but you can often end up with models that disagree about their conclusions. Uh, and when that happens, it can be hard to get, get crown truth because you're relying on slightly different assumptions, all of which deviate from reality. So the, on the other side, you have empirical models, which don't presume any very much in terms of 
how you expect behavior to occur, but instead you're just observing what occurs, often in aggregate, and then not considering yourselves with individual decisions. Um, the plus side here is that because it's data driven, it's easy you have ground truth sort of by definition, um, but uh, the problem is that you can't actually explain what's driving the behavior with these models. So sort of the sweet spot is a measurement model where you collect data to compare deviations from what you predict in your analytical models and then sort of va empirically validate um, your analytical model. Um, this is what you'd like to do. Um, it's, uh, it's hard to do, um, but if you um, plan in advance um, and construct your model in a way that you can collect data, uh, it can be very useful. So a note on model complexity. So let's say you're trying to compare some the relationship between some variable x and a dependent variable y. You've observed some data points you know, for different values of x and y. Uh, a simple model might just be a linear one. You know, so you find a best fit line. Um, but if you do that, there's going to be some measurement error. Um, because you don't perfectly fit the points, so you could make your model more complex. So say instead of doing a linear model, do a cubic one, and you can completely eliminate error on the data that you have. Um, but uh, this makes that model more complex and potentially uh, less accurate uh, and robust for, for making predictions. Um, so uh, for example, if you compare a linear model, it's prediction at this point x I've in, indicated on here, you, know, you have a much larger value for y in the simple model, uh, and you have a, a very different one than a more complex one. So which one is the, which one is the true reality? Well, you don't know until you've observed it. Observed it. Um, and so it turns out that you could very well end up in a situation where if the linear model is more uh, closer to what's actually driving the reality, the error on adding new points could be much less than in the case of the more, your more complex model that seemingly had uh, the minimized error to begin with. So there's a big risk of overfitting as your model becomes more complex. So um, you can sort of visualize this as sort of comparing as you increase your number of parameters, you're going to drive down your model error. So that seems good. But then your effort in modeling is going to grow up. And your effort, certainly your effort to collect data to validate is going to, be, is going to grow exponentially too. Um, so the idea is you'd like to find this sort of sweet spot somewhere along the line here where you've, done, you've had just enough uh, complexity in your model uh, to actually be informative. And so this, this uh, often gets simplified to this um, principle of Occ Occam's razor, which came from a monk in the 14th century. Um, here's the Latin if you'd like to read it. Um, I'll leave that as an exercise to you. But the Eng English translation roughly is that entities must not be multiplied by beyond necessity. And it's, this, this, this Occam's razor gets um, often translated into saying, you know, you only want to, if you have, you have two answers and one is more uh, simple than the other, you go with the simpler answer. You go with the simpler solution and the one that's more complex. You only accept complexity if it provides value. Okay, so that's all we have for step one. We'll continue in the next video.